Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ancient Life Voice class. Now, for the last two weeks, we have been covering some very important and very heavy topics. We looked at the consequences of war and what happens when people lose. Uh, we looked at the late Calcolithic mass burials at Tel Breck uh, that were chiefly investigated by Augusta McMahon. And we have also uh, started looking, we started looking last week at ancient burial life ways and observed different ways in which people have been buried. So we looked at the shaft graves and particularly the one in Jordan. Uh, but we also looked at the Pithaway burials uh, that were typically used in southern and northern Mesopotamia, so Mesopotamia as a whole, and also how this was also used along the northern Levantine coastline, so roughly the area from modern-day Lebanon all the way north to about the Turkish Anatolian region. We also looked at burials that were characterized by transhumans uh, and by uh, nomadic lifestyles and to see which ways they buried their dead and honored them. And today what we're going to be doing is looking at uh, cave burials. And particularly we're going to be looking at those cave burials that were in Israel or the southern Levant. And Israel presents a lot of uh, very good opportunities for uh, cave burials. Of course, we know that along the eastern portion of the Israeli border today, we have the Shephala and we have the, the foothills and the mountains, which run pretty much from completely north to south in the land of Israel. And around Jerusalem, we know that there are a lot of cave burials. We also know that in Hebron, there are some areas where they did cave burials. But especially cave burials were used in the southeastern Judean desert. Uh, this is the area and really kind of a, a triangular area that was made up of Jerusalem, Jericho, and then to the south, the Qumran area, which bordered the northern Dead Sea region. And so this Judean desert, which is separate from the Negev, the Negev is uh, very different but the Judean desert is very characterized by uh, aridity. It's not very humid. Uh, there's an occasional rainstorm or two and humidity that does get into the area. But generally, it's very dry. And what this allows for is for storage. Uh, the Judean desert became a great opportunity and place for people to have burials, but also to put important personal objects in. So they would put uh, things like coins. Uh, they would put documents. Uh, they might put in a lot of a number of other objects that were personally important. And what would happen was these caves are just very naturally created. Uh, soil erosion allows for them to uh, allows the landslides to take place and uh, you put these items into the caves. Now, many of us are very familiar with uh, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, and this is the area in which we will be looking today. Now, as I've said, these caves have been used for millennia. Uh, we have evidence uh, all the way from the Neolithic period, all the way through to the Roman period, uh, where people were burying uh, documents, uh, and as I said, coins and other objects. But another use of it was personal inhumations or burials. And very specifically, we'll be looking at the burial of the cave of the warrior or cave number 13, which was uncovered in 1992 or 1993. It was in that area. And the Cave of the Warrior was a very special find because we actually found in that cave a fully articulated skeleton and many different objects that were supremely well preserved. Uh, one of the best preserved finds that we have ever uh, come across. And again, uh, the unique find of the fully articulated skeleton. So uh, what makes the Cave of the Warrior so important? Well, uh, 
a few things. Number one, it covers three different periods. It covers the Neolithic, the Chalcolithic, and the Hasmonean period. Uh, the Hasmonean period was characterized by a coin hoard that was found and has led to a lot of very important discoveries and ideas about numiastics during that time. The Neolithic finds were characterized by bifacial uh, charts and by lithics, some microliths, as well as some long Canaanian blades that were found. A lot of times these were used for various purposes, but many times they were used as arrowheads, but they could also be used as knives or daggers. And another use was actually in surgery. You can literally open somebody's skin uh, very easily, cut somebody. Uh, so you could use them for surgery if you had to. But it's the late count, or excuse me, the calcolithic find of the warrior that has drawn the most attention. This was one of the most important discoveries in the region because it was a complete skeleton, complete articulated person. And the person was wrapped in very well-preserved material that was actually a very high quality. Uh, this person was able to accumulate a lot of wealth and uh, there was also some very sophisticated and very well-preserved matting in the burial. One of the things which chiefly characterized and why we call it the Cave of the Warrior is that it was found to contain four arrow shafts, two that were made of reeds and two that were made of hardwoods. But we also found a bow, uh, approximately 125 centimeters in length or about 49 inches long, and it was ritually killed. Another very interesting aspect of this was that the bow was covered, uh, painted essentially in red ochre. And that is something that is not typically seen in burials, especially in uh, this region. As you remember, we talked about the bow that was recovered in tomb A114N in Jordan in the shaft grave. It was whole, it was not ritually killed, it was not broken and it was not painted. It was just very plain. It was kind of an everyday type of uh, bow. But this particular occupant really found a lot of significance uh, in this bow. Other items that were found in the cave, like the sandals and other personal effects were also covered in the red ochre. So we know that this red ochre and uh, whatever it symbolized was very important. But what is really unique about this is that this may have been a case of ancient discrimination. And the reason why I say that is because there are many aspects of this burial that differ completely from burials in the region. Number one, this cave allowed us to do a lot of morphological analysis on the occupant. Most of the time in these caves, we have a single skull, or we might have some hand bones or uh, arm bones or leg bones, but never a complete skeleton. And so there can be some discovery and some idea of who the occupant might have been, but this was the first time that we were able to do that type of examination. So we found that it is a male. Uh, whether he identified as a male, we don't know, but we do know it was a male body. And uh, another very interesting thing was that morphologically, he was different from a lot of the other bodies that we have found. The occipital or the, the orbital for the eyes, the eye cavities were a bit larger than the ones in the region. Also the nasal cavity was a little bit larger than what is generally found. And so definitely this person was not native to the region. This person had come out of to this part of Canaan. Another unique factor is all of the archery accoutrements. Uh, especially for the late Calcolithic period, most of the burials that we see are characterized by daggers, by spears, 
and also kind of the double-headed axe. Uh, and we found we find these at Beth Shen, we find them at Jericho, and even in some areas like Jerusalem. So uh, very different type of findings, which means, but there's a very unique status to this cave area. And that is that many archery related finds are found here. Uh, so not in the city, but definitely in, I guess, the ruler area of this uh, country. And so there is a suggestion that this person was buried in that region for two different reasons. Number one, because they were an archer and also because they were not native to the region. And another clue might be the fact that the bow was killed. I, again, in most of the research that I have conducted and in a lot of the research that has come to the attention of other people, uh, breaking up bows or ritually killing them is something that it was not common to see in this region. We do see it commonly in Africa. It is uh, seen also in Western Europe and in some other European instances, but not generally in even Levantine, Northern Levantine uh, burial context, or even those uh, like the one in Jordan, uh, it was whole. And so there are various reasons why a bow may be broken, might be killed. One of those is obviously that the owner may have taken a lot of his identity from that bow. He may have taken a lot of his self-worth and value uh, from that bow. And so in the process of breaking it, uh, they definitely say, no, you can't have this after I pass away. You know, I'm taking this into the afterlife. It could mean the cessation of power. It could be that he was a chief or a leader and he was ritually ending his leadership. But more, but more interestingly, we also do have instances of breaking bows, such as in the Hittite area, uh, for purposes of being cursed. Uh, they would, there is an actual curse formula in which the uh, arrow shafts are broken and the bow is broken, and the person says, you know, my bow be broken, and may I wear women's clothing, may I become a woman. Uh, you know, in the ancient world, uh, becoming a woman was not the word that it is nowadays. Uh, not a lot of people were seeking after that, but it definitely was not sought after in the ancient world, and it was part of a curse formula. So it is possible that this person was being cursed, so they were being isolated from everybody else placed amongst the other archers, but not with uh, the people of Jericho. And then also cursed in the afterlife uh, once they were passing away. So many different things to consider. And it is important to look for these clues and understandings to possible examples of ancient forms of discrimination. Was this person buried here as part of a discriminatory process in which they could not share in uh, the burial rites in with the other people, with people that they had served. And these are important questions that we need to be asking and seeking after for uh, purposes of scholarship and also asking ourselves these important questions in life. Thank you very much. I really 